My name is Brendan Haynes. Uh, I'm a research technician at the UVM Proctor Maple Research Center. Um, today I'm going to be talking about syrup quality and the potential darkening that can happen in retail containers after packing. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to have this position and be able to present research for everybody. So I hope you guys find some use out of the information I bring and you can take some home. Uh, before I get started, I know we went over it in the morning, um, but we have a few resources that are through UVM that are new um, and available to everybody. So hopefully, um, if you find 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 use from any of those resources, that's that's a plus. Um, and I have that information compiled on a handout up front. Um, so if anything grabs your eye, uh, you can grab the handout and do all the information's there. Um, it's not going to be a very long talk. Not the actual research itself is pretty quick to present, so I'll fill in some of the um, room beforehand, just introducing some brief introductory topics about color and grading and the formation of color and flavor. So yeah. There's also a feature where if you're interested or if you have an, uh, a resource that you think is useful to either you or if you think uh, your neighbors might find it useful also, there's a feature that allows you to submit uh, suggested additions and it'll go through uh, the website um, for review. Never late in my version. <laughs> well, you didn't miss anything. I have everything I just said on, on a paper <laughs> in the front. And you heard Mark say it earlier this morning too. He said the same thing. Maybe a little differently though. Um, the UVM Practice Center. Morning. Afternoon. <laughs> it's morning somewhere. Yeah. Um, the UVM Practice Center also has uh, a YouTube channel. Um, this YouTube channel has 75 plus videos. Um, it was a wide range of topics. It was uh, general research, old conference presentations, uh, staffing and tubing skills. Um, there's a number of stuff up there. Um, it's kind of an eclectic range of content on it. Uh, there's anything from me filming something with my phone in the woods, something I run into, to uh, a really well produced uh, videos. Um, there's a new series titled Key to High Sap Yields. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, work and production value really going into those. Um, there's four currently on the website, um, uh, and each each episode is a different topic. Um, so it could be anywhere from uh, high vacuum to leak checking, uh, proper spell placement, um, and there's eight more to come. Uh, we're constantly adding more. Uh, there's also the Vermont Maple Minute, uh, which is a collection of short one to two minute podcasts uh, produced by Mark Isselhart. Um, he has a wide range, again, of topics. Could be anywhere from maple grading to sugar bush management. Um, there's also uh, Vermont Maple Biz, which is organized by uh, UVM Extension Associate Professor Mark Canella. He's compiled a list of business modules and tools on this website. Um, it's a very interactive experience going through. Um, there's, there's something for everybody. Um, the resources are aimed for helping prospective and existing sugar makers, uh, landowners, and uh, forest managers. So there's tools for everybody. Um, he also does a lot of work uh, coordinating the uh, annual Maple Business Benchmark reports for the Northeast, um, and so he report or has a link to those annual reports uh, yearly through Vermont Maple Biz, um, and he's also just got a new domain name uh, under Maple Management, Maple Manager. Don't quote me on it; it's on the sheet, <laughs> but it's brand new. Uh, there's not too much content on it quite yet, um, but that's also in the works. So. Um, yep, and before I get started, I'll fill in some content on uh, 
uh, syrup grading and color and flavor formation. Um, when we talk about, oh, no worries, I'm just getting started. <coughs> talk about color in the context of samples of um, samples of syrup for retail sale um, what we're really referring to is um, light transmittance uh, value uh, the amount of light that's transmitted through your sample um, not necessarily the color um, and so this this value this light transmittance value can be found in a couple different ways uh, one way is using a grading kit which I'm sure this looks pretty familiar to everybody um, this, this grading kit uh, compares your sample of syrup um, to a collection of glycerin standards which represent the dividing lines between each grade. So when you take your sample and fit it between the next lightest <coughs> uh, standard and the next darkest standard, um, you can place your sample within a range. Um, and usually that's accurate enough to find what grade your sample's in. Um, <coughs> Uh, the other way is to use a, a digital grader, like a hand of checker, um, which I have one of those up on the slide coming up. Um, and what that does is it takes your sample of syrup and it compares it to a pure glycerin standard and it returns a value that represents a percent of light that transmits through your sample. And um, that, that value can be compared to this, uh, this chart here. Um, it, places your sample within its corresponding uh, grade. So this is this classification system is now internationally recognized as of recently. Um, the names have changed. It's a dual flavor and color grading system, um, which is fairly new, but if some people are used to using certain language, like fancy per se, um, that can still be used for marketing purposes. Um, however, this is how it's used to grade and um, be placed into a grade. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to just speak up. I can do them on the fly. I don't mind doing that before you forget anything. <laughs> um, yeah. So color and flavor formation are the result of a complex series of reactions that happen before and during boiling. Um, some of these reactions begin before the sap even reaches a sugar house. Um, this, they actually start at the tree. Uh, the sap, as it's coming out of the tree, has sugar content, and by sugar content I don't mean the concentration of sugar. I mean the types of sugar that are coming out of this tree are mainly sucrose. You're going to find between 96 and 99% of the sugar that's coming out of the tree are, is uh, sucrose. One thing I want to, before I move on, is this is an enzymatic process. So it's microbes growing and using enzymes to make, cause changes in the sap chemistry. Um, and once it enters the evaporator, it uh, begins a series of non-enzymatic reactions, um, non-enzymatic browning reactions that uh, produce color and flavor compounds. Now, there's a number of different processes that uh, lead to the formation of color, uh, color and flavor but uh, the more dominant pathways happen closer to the front of the evaporator. Um, and this is through the, the Maird reactions, or the Maillard reactions and caramelization. Um, the Maillard reactions uh, can be thought of more as a chemical reaction as, as opposed to something mainly caused by heat. Uh, it's a reaction between amino acids and the reducing sugars. Uh, and in this context, the reducing sugars are our invert products, glucose and fructose. Um, so you can think of this in a way that's sort of like if you were to take a slice off of an apple uh, and it browns, um, that's more like what a Maillard reaction is. Um, it's not the case where you put sugar in a pan and heat it up until it turns brown and, or black, um, which is more like caramelization. 
caramelization happens with high temperatures. Um, these high temperatures for different sugars, or the temperature different sugars caramelize at is going to be different. Uh, so sugars like sucrose happens at a much higher temperature. It's like 320 degrees. And hopefully we don't get anywhere close to that in our evaporators. <laughs> uh, but um, fructose, invert products like fruct fructose, uh, they caramelize at lower temperatures, like 230 degrees. Now even though this temperature is still higher than finished syrup, um, through the interface of uh, nitre on the pins, the nitre absorbs heat more and it traps sugar molecules into that nitre and it allows those sugar molecules to reach higher temperatures and then they can cycle out from there. So before I move on, um, some of the processes that I just touched on have a certain degree of control over them. Um, so pan niter, uh, managing the niter on your pans, uh, maintaining cleaner pans, will uh, not allow sugars to caramelize as, as readily. Um, it's not a perfect world that we live in, but um, may I could by controlling niter levels and also invert levels. Um, because invert sugars are the substrate that are required for both uh, these non-enzymatic reactions. Um, with lower invert levels, you'll have a lower degree of the Maillard reactions happening, and with lower amounts of fructose, caramelization won't be, won't be able to occur as easily. So, after all that happens, we could end up with a product that looks like this. Um, but, what happens after, after you pack? Um, can be a little different. So hot packing into drums um, after filtering and everything and, and it's hot packed into drums with as little headspace as possible and a tightly secured cap. And when I'm saying little headspace in our sugar house we bring it up to bottom ring, bottom thread on the on the cap um, and then we close it as tight as as we safely can without ruining, <laughs> uh, ruining the cap. Um, uh, there should be little change in color um, uh, and grade in that barrel. I don't know the time frame on that. I, I don't know if that stays for 5, 10, 20 years, but as far as uh, for the one year that, I'm th that we're working with, uh, our barrels don't change very much at all. Um, however, retail containers, that can be a different story. Um, and that's because retail containers uh, are made from a material called high-density polyethylene um, and this material is, material is used mainly because of its low cost uh, and it uh, also is able to withstand uh, the temperatures required to hot pack its contents. Um, so that can be useful. However, it has a moderate degree of permeability to oxygen. Uh, and why is that a problem? Here, uh, we set up a visual exercise in our sugar house last spring. Um, and what we did here is we filled up three sample jars off of the filter press with varying levels of headspace. Uh, so the one on the left ha has as little air as possible as I could get in there. Um, the middle one has just below the top rim. Uh, and then the third one has about two thirds full. It was about two thirds full. Uh, and then we placed them in the windowsill uh, and we left them for 12 days. This is what we found. Can everybody see that? I'm going to shut the light out because this is a good visual. I want to yeah, kind of see what we ended up running into. Um, yeah, so we ended up with a layer of darkened syrup on the top, which is not much of a surprise. Um, and this one, the one with more air seems to have more darkened syrup on it. Um, and the important takeaway from that is that uh, exposure to oxygen can darken syrup uh, and it happens over time. It doesn't happen right away. It's not something that happens as it's coming off the filter press into your container. It happens over time. Um, and it continues to happen until the oxygen source runs out. 
So if your containers are permeable to oxygen, in theory, there's a constant exposure to oxygen uh, that your syrup that's packed inside it has. Um, so how do we fix this? Um, <coughs> packing into glass or tin, I'll mention, get that out of the way. Packing into glass or tin are a different story. Um, you won't experience darkening as much. Um, tin, you can run into some weird things if you store it there for too long. Um, but, and also glass, uh, there is a, a small degree of darkening that occurs, but not quite as much. Um, and there's a figure later on that, that can describe that. Um, I can show that. Um, and also, uh, hillside plastics, uh, through the inventor, with the inventor Richard Haas, uh, developed a method of um, manufacturing plastic syrup jugs uh, that use a material called polyvinyl iodine chloride, which is not quite as important as knowing that it's pretty close to the material that saran wrap is made of. Um, <laughs> basically the same, same material, um, it's just in food grid lacquer form that's applied to the outside of the container. And this, uh, this coating is uh, intended to create an oxygen barrier around the exterior of these HDPE containers, retail containers. And it makes it shiny. Um, but this, um, this figure shows the uh, difference in oxygen permeability between our XL coating, the polyvinyl iodine, or XL coating, um, which this bar here represents the degree of oxygen permeability. And it's not very big. It occupies a few pixels on the screen, and that's about it. Um, and then here is our HDPE, uh, and this, this bar is pretty, pretty much substantially bigger. And then also another thing to point out is that this carrot uh, represents uh, a break in the scale of the graph. Uh, so if that carrot weren't there, this bar would have to be enormous <laughs> and off the chart. So uh, one important takeaway from this is just that it's a huge reduction in the oxygen permeability between these two materials. Uh, so the benefits of the Sugar Hill XL coating are that it reduces the darkening inside, uh, the darkening of syrup packed inside uh, in retail containers over time. Uh, it maintains your light transmittance value that it's packed at for longer. Um, and so that means that you can pack closer to uh, the dividing lines uh, uh, with less risk that that container is going to be found out of grade in the future. Uh, however, it costs a little bit more, um, 13 to 17% more. So is it worth it? Um, well, the uh, folks at the Proctor Center put the two styles of container to the test over the course of two years. Um, and in 2017, or 2018, it says it right there, um, the setup of the experiment, uh, basic setup was that we, uh, in coordination with three sources, collected uh, multiple samples uh, packed into each style of container, um, both coated and uncoated containers. Um, and these containers were shipped back to UVM uh, PMRC for analysis. And over the course of a number of months, in this case, I think it was six months, um, they were measured uh, monthly. Um, samples were measured from each style of container. Um, uh, from each source uh, over the course of months. This setup, we had three quarts per month per type. So we had a, um, a student that was taking samples from three separate quarts uh, of each style from each, from each producer. So it got pretty intensive. There was a lot of quarts lying around. <laughs> yes, sir? Oh, well, I can. I still can by hand, and I fill it right up to the within a quarter inch of the cap. Mm -hmm. I suspect that's overfilled by what's labeled on the jug as far as a half gallon or quart or whatever it may be. Are most people canning by volume? I actually got some syrup canned by someone else and it was probably that far down 
from the top. I suspect it was a half gallon, but I'm curious to know how other people filled after having seen your sample containers there. There's that if you were filling just by volume and knew what a half gallon of flow was, mm -hmm. there would be that airspace at the top which could potentially affect it. Right. What do you know about that? Um, so is your question how uh, about the practices of filling the jugs or what? Yeah, I think so. More than anything, it's already proven that it darkens. Right. The oxygen stays, yeah. so. um, I think as little headspace as possible is going to uh, solve problems more than just one type of problem. Um, you can't, if it's an uncoated container, you're not going to be able to escape the darkening no matter what. Um, but also as with the presence of air, you can experience um, mold growth, but if you hold it on the side, usually you can get away from it, oh, get away with that. Um, where we're at, we don't necessarily sell retail containers, so I don't worry about the volume quite as much, or we don't worry. So if you buy milk, for instance, right. it's down, I suspect we're all selling more than what it says on the jug, is that the case? Right. Um, I think, yeah, I think Maybe that, that like kind of... Maybe something isn't. Might, yeah, on the scale that they'll, they're selling, and it might be a different story. Right? Um, I think that extends beyond uh, the scope of this talk, but if you're interested in some of this material, I can find access to best practices for filling containers. Um, but as far as uh, the presence of air in retail containers for darkening, I can speak to that, and yeah, we'll, yeah as, as far as darkening goes. Um, and for this study, I wasn't present for the, the filling of the jugs, so I don't know if there was a consistent level of air in the top. Um, so that could be a source of variability, but I can't say that that existed because I wasn't involved in filling the, filling the jugs. Um, knowing the people who coordinated it, there was probably a consistent level of air if there, were, if there was air at all um, in the containers. Um, but yeah. Does that answer your question, Will? <laughs> um, okay, yeah, so uh, in this year, uh, the filling of the sample containers was not overseen by uh, folks at PMRC. Um, they were, the samples were asked to be packed by, uh, by us to the, um, to the source, the packers, um, where they filled the sample jars and then recorded baseline light transmittance data and then sent it all to us. Um, so there was no independent verification on the data that we originally got on the time of packing. Um, however, it should have been the same at the time of packing. If it's coming off the line, it should have been coming into the two different drugs at the same, same, uh, same grade. However, we couldn't identify that. We ran into some problems that made us, uh, made us clarify that. <coughs> Um, and they were also packed on the same day, except in the case of one of the packers. It was packed on both a Friday and a Monday, so that's also something to note. Um, 2019, it was the same basic setup, uh, except this year we had five sources, um, including PMRC. We included our own syrup for, uh, for the study. Um, and this year we also uh, independently verified and oversaw the packing of the samples. Um, our director, Tim Perkins, went and collected uh, cuvettes and light transmit baseline light, light transmittance data um, while also overseeing the filling of our containers. Um, so we can say that all the containers were filled at the same time um, and the data was recorded and verified from what was being filled into the containers. Um, and again, uh, monthly measurements were taken from each style of container, um, from each packer. Um, this year we used fewer samples, um, so instead of having three quarts, we had one quart that we'd open up of each style and take three measurements from that one quart. Um, just because seemed redundant, but it's important to note that once we opened a quart, that was not used again. Um, so there's no darkening after opening and measuring. Um, 
measurements were taken using a uh, henna digital grader, like the one, this one here. Uh, it's important to note that there is a 4% accurate accuracy on this machine, um, so that could be another source of variability in the data. Um, the machines were calibrated every day, the measurements were taken um, before the measurements were taken. Uh, and they were taken for about six to seven months, depending on the year, and measurements were taken by the same person uh, within each year. It was a different person for each year, but within that year, the same person was taking measurements the whole time. So, here are results from 2018. Uh, on the x-axis, we have our months, um, zero being the initial time of packing, uh, and our Y's light transmittance. Um, this blue checked line, it represents the, uh, the division between uh, amber and dark, and both cases could be described using linear regression, so it's a linear relationship that um, these samples are darkening at. Um, presumably, they should have started at the same point. Um, however, our first uh, data point was when they arrived at PMRC. Um, yeah, so presumably, it should be the same. Um, you can see a reduced, reduced rate of darkening in the XL coded containers when compared to the uncoded alter alternative. Um, and the uncoated containers dropped out of grade uh, on average in less than a month. Um, that might be a, a shocking statement, but if you look at it, it might have been packed pretty close to the grade to begin with, um, or the grade division to begin with. Um, and the XL coated container stayed in grade for about five months. <coughs> your syrup at 74 or 76 and you want to drop it down so that you're safe you might have good syrup in 2021 uh not that it's going to be bad or just your syrup might still be in grade uh, in 2021 um, it can take a while to drop out of grade you get this levels later in the year of the set always come out sterilely at that percentage and it only after it comes out breaks mm -hmm. down further yeah so in in the tree you have your uh sap sugar content and it's so mainly that's sucrose really that's coming out of the tree and the microbes are not going to be breaking it down inside the tree uh, but once it comes out it's being inoculated in your tubing system with these microbes that are growing in there through the off season so you have your bacteria and your fungi and yeasts that are growing in your system already. And so once it comes in contact with your system, that's when it starts breaking it down. Um, so within the season and by site to site, there's a number of different factors. And the reason, yeah, um, yeah, uh, you're going to get a different percentage of uh, sucrose to other complex higher sugars. Um, and so well, it does, it is just one way. So sucrose, uh, glucose, and fructose in our setting don't turn back into sucrose after, after they're inverted. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's other factors. Is it just the sugar that you're interested in? Or? I just, you know, I've heard talk about that a lot. I'm just interested if you had any other information on that because I've heard a lot about it. In, there's some bounce I pick up. in what context? Just like, the whole process. Yeah. There's a lot of talk around those uh, centered around syrup and its use for diabetes and different things and those levels of sugar and how they pertain to making products because that's, a, you know, nipple cream and that kind of stuff. Because those are very important. Yeah. Them. It's like yeah. fructose that you're not supposed to have if you have diabetes, right? Yeah. I've heard some, uh, someone say that and. I am not a doctor, and I'm not going to say if you have diabetes, you should have fancy syrup. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a number of different um, ways you can end up with fancy syrup. It's not just your invert levels, um, so it contributes to it. But you could have um, different types of sugar in a golden, uh, uh, golden delicate syrup. 
because um, like I was saying before, there are things like uh, um, pan niter and how hot you fire at. Um, and those are going to affect the color and grade of your, your, your system. Um, yeah. Uh, there's also other factors that create your grade, uh, grade of serif, that are not really controllable, um, like amino acids, you know, different acids that are coming out of the tree. That's going to vary from site to site and season to season. So that can also have an effect on the grade that you're having. So it's not, it's not as easy as saying, if it's in one of these five grades, you can expect to see this type yeah. of sugar or, or not. But you were saying it was a was it an amino acid and a protein reaction that creates nitre? No, reducing sugar. Reducing sugar that and creates color and flavor. Okay. Um, those are the Maillard reactions. Well, you you talked about something creates nitre. Reducing sugars and something else would. Mm, um, no, it through the process of caramelization. Um, our invert products interact with the interface of the pans and niter. So the niter absorbs heat from the, uh, from the fire below, uh, more so than the pans and that interface of the sugar getting caught up in the niter that has absorbed more heat um, brings that sugar to a higher temperature. Okay. That's, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Question about when the oxygen is interacting and changing the color, is it changing the, the sugar from sucrose to the other ones, or is that? No, that's a different process. Um, it's not, you're not breaking down, um, yeah, so it's not, if you're taking a lighter, lighter syrup, you're not getting color from sucrose being broken down into the different invert constituents. Um, I can't speak to what's happening when the oxygen's interacting with it. Uh, I don't know as much about that, but I do have access to the information if you're interested. Um, this is more of the one paragraph summary of what's going on. Um, and if you'd like the, the extensive reports and um, information about that, I can, I can direct you to where, where you can get that information. But that's a m more complicated process than was worth going into for the, the scope of this talk. All the things that you're saying to direct are on that website that you said we can Could be, not everything, no. but you might be able to, yeah. I mean, I tried to go through those so that if any information um, that I'm talking about here were on there, I wasn't either glazing over, skipping over, you know, missing something or saying it differently from how you'd find on there. So, so these slides and everything will be on? On the recording? <coughs> um, I'm imagine at some point maybe can't say that it will can't say it won't it's in the Maple News right now though um, so if you find, get your hands on yes sir so um, you guys have any data or even any anecdotal evidence of uh, uh, bulk containers whether it be epoxy coated drums or stainless versus Stainless, um, it's not, as far, it's not scientific data that we have. Um, actually, I'm going to retract that. I don't know if it's not scientific data. Um, it, uh, there's supposedly no change, or very minimal change, in stainless steel drums. I can't speak to epoxy, uh, epoxy line, or, which I, I believe it's the same, same case as an epoxy line. Can't speak to plastic drums. Um, I don't know if there is darkening in those, but I have thought, wondered if uh, there is a change in plastic plastic drums or any larger style storage. Uh, yeah, this mainly focuses on um, stainless steel drums and plastic retail containers. There might be bulk storage of syrup somewhere where there could be a difference, but I can't say if there is or isn't. Does that answer your question? With much information as you have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing that we could do is find out. Uh, I don't know about epoxy line, but if you're using plastic jugs or plastic barrels. Uh, yeah, fine. 
Oh, five gallon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I believe that's the same case. That's why people don't want to use those. If it's a high density polyethylene, mm -hmm. we can apply the same the same uh, yeah. assumptions yeah. towards that container too. Uh, yeah. Unless it's coated. Not enough of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Good, good, good job. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Producer partners, um, Sugar Hell helped us financially, and Citadel, LB Maple Tree, Butternut Mountain, and Bascom's all helped uh, contribute uh, so the syrup for the study. So they all really helped make it happen. Um, yeah. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. So now that we know this, right? You open up the container and it's at 55. Right. So you're going to label it to be rich. It sets on the shelf. For month and a half, mm -hmm. it's now become robust. What are we supposed to label? As far well as as far as uh, color goes, as far as flavor, it won't it shouldn't affect it. Um, there's no data uh, that uh, reports whether there's a change in flavor, but anecdotally we weren't finding much of a change in flavor um, except in the condition uh, in the case of extreme darkening, um, there's some suggestion that there could be a change in flavor. Um, after extreme darkening. Now, I don't know what extreme means. Uh, I don't know if that means 50% loss or, um, but, so the, uh, the flavor shouldn't be affected as far as going from rich to robust, but uh, the color will be affected, so I'll go from an amber to a dark. Um, but if one's found out of green, um, Either one, like, and then uh, the other. The whole sample is about that degree. And um, from my understanding, is that light is a lot easier to measure than flavor. So. <laughs> flavor is subjective. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Just an observation. I did an unscientific experiment like way back when Excel was a new thing, mm -hmm. pretty new. Mm -hmm. And I put pints on a shelf in a pantry, and I opened them at different stages, a couple months apart. Mm -hmm. And I did different grades, and I also did golden that was made early in the season, and gold or fancy back then, mm -hmm. that was made late in the season. And I found early season fancy didn't change in, in either job, whether it be coated or non-coated. But I found the darker grades, or the later the season, the faster, the more likely it was to darken in the uncoated jug. Really? And the more it darkened. Hmm. That's what I found. That's interesting. But that's unscientific. But I was totally convinced that the XL coating made a big difference, the especially big in the darker grades. I wasn't convinced it made any difference in nice, fancy surf. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak to that uh, because this study we're using 60 and 55 um, percent. That's what it was packed at. So I, I can't say that there is not, but the visual exercise that we're using, we packed that at, um, that was, I can't remember, but I don't think we made much less than well, 70, it was probably in the 70s, high 70s range, and that darkened pretty decently when exposed to oxygen. So that's the only thing that I, yeah. And of course, I was just visually comparing it. I had right. no way to yeah. do a light transmit. So. Huh, that's interesting. I was talking the other day with some people, and they were wondering if there's different uh, different size jugs will behave differently. Well, that, that was going to be a question of mine. Yeah. The quantity of syrup in that mm. jug makes a big difference or not. I can't say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> study. Yeah. <laughs> So more surface area is a lot more right, yeah. Yeah. But there's also a lot more volume for it to darken. Right. <coughs> yeah. 
where do you think the air is penetrating on the top of the That's gap? Through, through the plastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, through the plastic. Through the coating? I mean... Oh, uh, hmm. as far as the darkening of the coating containers? Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, I was wondering how far up the up into like the threads. It's only on the exterior, so I don't know how far up the side of the container it goes. Uh, there could be air in the top. Just when it, when it goes through the machine, unless they've modified it in recent years, the, the container has a cap on it, so it can't get under the cap, the XL coating, unless they've modified the machine. So the whole containers covered except under the cap is the way that I do Oh, this. okay, no kidding. As they're coating, coating the retail containers? The, the actual they're done the with the cap on it? Huh. It goes, it used to at least, go through, I know they have a new machine now, but it, it actually had a cap on it that is what held it as it went through the machine. Wow. Oh, so it's kept from being coated on the threads. Yeah, yeah. see that's interesting. Uh, there's that. I was also wondering um, how um, maybe on the cap like that that uh, that seal but I, I don't imagine it would be there um, it could also be from the amount of air that's packed it's packed with on the top um, I'm not sure can't say um, it is still permeable to oxygen just a lot less, less. yeah what, well, what, what is light, light to pack that on? like if it wasn't if it was in glass it's not well, well, light I, color. Oh, I can't speak to that. What is your guess? <laughs> right. I can't say. I've, I haven't found much uh, much difference. I mean, yeah, I haven't had an issue with that. Uh, but I can't say that there isn't a problem with that. Um, as far as light degradation, we have to replace our um, grading kits yearly. Uh, because uh, the UV light degrades the samples that are in it. Now it's gl glycerin, but and not serum. But it's something that is an, can be an issue. More questions? Um, I saw people writing some notes down. Um, if there are any slides that you guys want me to go back to, so that you can get information you might have missed or might have not been able to write down all the way. I'd be happy to go back. Oh shoot. <laughs> I got quite a bit of time, I think. I have a feeling. Oh, it's not too bad. I think technically, based on the new grading standards, and that's a good question, the way I understand it, that if the color or the flavor changes, you have to go with the the darker of whatever it is. Right. But I don't think there's many of us that are That's actively opening these containers after they've been on the shelf for more than six months. Right. Taking a sample and saying this is degraded and what's great and then right. change it because the flavor is the same. But, you know, perhaps if it was in glass, you might have to do something different. Right. But I think that we all That's why we're, that's why we're allowed to label it as having the grade that it actually is or darker so it can drop below the grade and i'm sorry if i glazed over that or <laughs> missing that so you know, if you did have one grade as a grade a rich and now it falls into the grade a robust because of colors it's a robust label right yeah if it were either of the two, mark it as the lower, the lower, lower dark, robust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did did that answer? Did I answer your question all the way? And I forgot to repeat the questions in the microphone. <laughs> oh, but. So, is, yes, is there any more you can talk about? We spent a little time on the slide of sucrose breaking down into glucose and glucose. Is there any more to talk about that? I mean, that's not a, it's a reaction that only happens one way. Sucrose being split. Yeah. And everything goes right. back. Great. You talk about sap being mostly 99, 96% sucrose.